Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Peppis, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Stacy Alimo, professor of English and environmental studies at the University of Oregon. Alimo is an internationally recognized scholar of American literature, ecocultural theory, environmental humanities, science studies, and gender theory. Alimo has written three monographs, Undomesticated Ground, Resisting Nature as Feminist Space, Bodily Natures, Science, Environment, and the Material Self, and Exposed, Environmental Politics and Pleasures in Post-Human Times. She co-edited Material Feminisms with Susan Heckman, uh, edited the 28 chapter volume Matter in the gender series of Macmillan Interdisciplinary Handbooks, and edited a special volume of Configurations on Science Studies and the Blue Humanities. She's currently writing a new book, Composing Blue Ecologies, Science, Aesthetics, and the Creatures of the Abyss. Alimo joined the UO faculty in fall 2019 after 25 years of teaching at the University of Texas at Arlington. Thank you, Stacy, for coming on the show. Thank you. So um, the University of Oregon prides itself at being a place where uh, cutting edge work in environmental humanities is going on. How do you understand what that means, environmental humanities? Well, the environmental humanities, if, if, if you think about uh, science over here and, and the arts and humanities over here, then the environmental humanities is all about environmentalism in those fields, so environmental art, history, literature, um, et cetera. I resist the, that category a bit because I think that environmental studies needs to, even if it's starting in an English department and looking at, say, films or literature, that it has to have some connection with science studies. Mm -hmm. And so I, I moved into the environment, what's now called more recently the environmental humanities through science studies because I think that the two have to be in very close conversation. So. Um, I don't want to keep the, that divide in place there. Mm -hmm. so. well, that's interesting. So I'm going to ask you to, to um, define some of the key terms that you use in your work. A uh, number of these are terms that you help to define. So the first is post-humanism. So how do you understand what post-humanism is? So uh, again, you could, you could start with this sense of the humanities in the Western tradition, and all of this is about a divergence from the Western tradition. Of course, something like um, indigenous thought would have no need for post-humanism because they did not begin with this radical divide between nature and culture, human and non-human life. And so if you're starting from a Western tradition though, post-humanism is a way of critiquing those divides um, and critiquing the constitution of the human where, whereby the human is constituted by basically taking away particular qualities from all other life forms. So all of the definitions say um, humans are the only ones, that human exceptionalism is what we call it. Humans are the only ones with language or with culture or with art or you go down the line and it's actually not true. So if you go to, to scientific studies of various uh, animal species, a lot of those species have those, um, those characteristics, they do those things. Um, so the definition of, of, of the human in Western culture has predominantly enclosed the human, separated the human, and made the human completely um, superior and transcendent to all other life forms. And so critical post-humanism um, critiques that philosophy and that kind of daily life uh, set of assumptions or ideologies. Mm -hmm. So the second big term is new materialism. Mm -hmm. So this is a term that you are one of the creators of this term, so tell us what that is. So new materialism, again, it comes out of a critique of, of, of Western cultures, and it's basically, from the standpoint of philosophy and especially social construction, where um, there's an emphasis on human ideas and human will and human action, and there's a sense of the rest of the planet as being inert or passive. New materialism, for me, focuses um, a great deal on uh, activity, material agencies or material activities. So you can see this in um, the simple sense of 
um, let's say the Army Corps of Engineers builds a bunch of dams to control water. Well, then the water does whatever it wants for whatever reason. And so thinking of a much more complicated set of interactions across different domains. So you might have an ideology, a perspective as a culture or as a, as a as a sort of activity on the world, and then the world might kick back against that idea. So I do think social construction has been a really important theory in a lot of areas, and the critique of things like gender is very important, the critique of race, but there has to be a point where you allow material agencies to interact with ideas. And so that, to me, is the key for new materialism. And the last term, also one of your own, is transcorporeality. How do you understand that term? So to me, transcorporeality is a mode of new materialism where you start with the human and the embodied human and you think through all of the ways in which we are interconnected with the material substances of the world. Mm -hmm. And so it's, um, it comes out of Ulrich Beck's notion of risk society in which he says it used to be that people could assess the dangers of things. You know, if you had children and there was a cliff you knew that you didn't want them to fall off the cliff. If you feed your children breakfast now, you don't know what's in their breakfast, what's in their drinking water. And so how do you assess um, that sense in which we have affected the world so thoroughly, which is now called the Anthropocene, We're, we've affected the world so thoroughly, but we actually lack the ability to, to deal with that. And so I think that for me, the important part of transcorporeality is that it makes environmentalism never an uh, elective option, because it's always already with us and in us and we're not separate from the world. Hmm. And that the way that the world is, is uh, set up, it's, it's under um, the commodification and individualism and all these things, we like to think of the world as outside us and, and there for our use. And instead, thinking of all of these things happening, I think is a richer sense and then it makes us be accountable in more ways in terms of environmental justice and environmentalism. Okay, so now I wanna sort of try to trace the trajectory of your scholarly career now that we've, we've talked about these big key terms that, that are crucial for your work. So the, your first book, your first monograph is Undomesticated Ground, Resisting Nature as Feminist Space. Mm -hmm. So you can give us like a snapshot of the argument mm -hmm. of that book? Yeah, that argument's a pretty, a pretty easy one to condense down, I think. So. Uh, women have been associated with nature in all sorts of ways, and even though there's something called ecofeminism that takes that up in a positive way, there's a lot of problems with that because a lot of the ways in which women and nature have been associated are negative toward women mm -hmm. um, and also negative toward, toward nature. Mm -hmm. And so in, in that first book, I look at specific historical moments um, like the struggle for birth control in the 1920s and talk about how did various women recast the term nature in order that it could be in alliance with feminism. And this was written in the time when everybody was critiquing essentialist notions, which is very important. And yet what I thought was really interesting was there are so many women who look toward nature, especially, say, theories of evolution and change, and they saw nature as a place where everything is changing. So I, I, I did a discursive analysis of, of these different sites. But then at the end of that, I thought it was ironic that I didn't have a way of really getting at um, anything other than just textual and discursive critique. And so then that led me to trying to figure out um, what's now called new materialism and to find different modes of, of keeping the critique of various cultural formations, but then allowing some kind of access to other, uh, other agencies so that um, so that it's more in keeping with a kind of environmentalist vision. Mm -hmm. So I, I assume from what you're suggesting is that that's the kind of project of the second volume. That's the correct? second volume, okay, so yes. The, so yes, the second monograph yes. is called Bodily Nature, yes. Science, Environment, and the Material Self. So tell us about that one. Okay, so that one um, is where I developed the concept of transcorporeality, mainly from environmental health and environmental justice movements. And I think that it began when I did a Greenpeace uh, mercury test so this this test had you um, take a bit cut a big chunk of your hair off 
put it in an envelope and mail it off. And then it came back to you and it had this piece of paper that just had this number about how much mercury was in your body. And then it told you what you could do about it politically and what you could do about it in terms of what you eat. And I thought, this is so weird, you know, to be politically active by sending my hair in through the mail, getting this incomprehensible number back that meant nothing to me, mm. and then trying to make sense of what all of that meant. And in my mind, I really saw this kind of mapping, right? Like the mapping of, say, mercury through tuna fish sandwiches my mother gave me as a child, mm -hmm. or through air pollution. And then, so that's really the sense of transcorporeality that all of these larger economic and political and environmental issues are, are actually going through our bodies and are, we're interconnected to them. And so that was the second book that focused mainly on that. And then the third book. Um, so let me just give okay. the title. Okay. <laughs> Exposed <laughs> Environmental Politics and Pleasures in Posthuman Times. And that one came about primarily because people, I, I had written um, a lot of other essays that, that extended the sense of transcorporeality, not to um, environmental health and environmental justice as much, but to all sorts of other topics. And also people kept wanting me, people kept wanting a theory of transcorporeality that was more upbeat <laughs> because, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they wanted, they wanted, when I would give talks, people would say, well, what about something happy and pleasurable that's transcorporeal? And I resisted that because I was mainly writing about toxins and I was using disability studies and um, environmental justice and environmental racism issues, and none of that is really upbeat. Uh, so, but then I thought, well, you know, I'm kind of persuaded by the idea that environmentalism does have to have some kind of pleasurable aspect, otherwise people will, will not, th they will turn away from it, they're not going to be attracted to it, mm -hmm, so. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So there's, um, there's a couple of other questions I have as a res uh, in response to the, the most recent book, Exposed. So one of the things you talk about there is non-human sexual diversity. So tell us about non-human sexual diversity and in particular its implications for environmentalism. Um, well, okay, so the, its implications for environmentalism are, are pretty interesting because you have things like hormone disruptors in the environment and um, people like uh, Giovanna DiCiro and Kate Sandilands have written about this um, quite a bit. The idea that if, if the science was so biased because of homophobia, then there's no actual baseline, there's no um, adequate baseline to talk about whether these chemicals are disrupting endocrine systems, whether they're having these effects or not. Um, there, Kate writes about how there was this case of the, the lesbian seagulls or something, mm -hmm. and, the, and it was used as an antitoxin, um, in an antitoxin campaign as evidence that toxins are changing the ecosystem. But actually, this whole biodiversity of uh, sexual diversity of creatures is so huge that you can't get that. You can't, you can't, um, you didn't have the basic science to be able to even talk about whether there's endocrine disruptors or not. So, um, the, so in that, in that part, I talk about, um, both the science and the homophobia in the science, which has been well documented, um, but then also this magnificent sexual diversity of creatures. And some of that does go along with a kind of new materialist vision of exuberance and change. Mm -hmm. And um, so a kind of a f affirmation of biological diversity that parallels cultural and other forms of diversity. So another concept uh, from that book that I was interested in is Climate heavy masculinity. So, what is climate heavy masculinity? <laughs> right. Um, so, I just moved here from Texas, mm -hmm. and Texas is a good place to start for climate heavy masculinity. Um, I was I was asked to talk in Copenhagen about um, climate change and gender, and I wasn't working on climate change and gender at all. But what what struck me was this irony of me from Texas going to Copenhagen and talking to them about gender where everybody on Copenhagen is on bikes, you know, even the, the officials, the government officials are on their bikes and their suits and riding around. Um, climate heavy masculinity on the other hand would be things like gigantic pickup trucks with the, um, 
In Texas, we have a lot of uh, testicles hanging from the pickup trucks, which is really lovely. And then there's also the rolling coal movement mm. where people are deliberately saying, you know, F you to environmentalists and to the government by deliberately uh, making their vehicles shoot out black clouds of smoke. And so, um, the masculinity part has to do with the long history and gender studies of seeing um, what I think it's Susan Jeffords calls the hard body, hard body masculinity. And so the vehicles become a kind of embodiment, these big, hard vehicles that um, are very powerful and super aggressive and anti environmentalist. It's sort of all of a piece and, you know, its own mode of, um, it may not even be climate denial, but just. Not caring about it, at yeah. deliberately blowing not smoke on bikers who are on the e side of the exactly road. Exactly, yeah. blowing smoke on the bikers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So your newest project, the one that you're working on, is called Blue Ecologies, and it's part of this movement called the Blue Humanities. So what is the Blue Humanities? So most of environmental uh, work in the humanities has been about land-based environmentalisms and animal studies as well. And there's very little done until recently on the ocean and ocean creatures. And you could also include rivers and lakes and other, other water studies, uh, depending on how you're defining it. So uh, basically extending um, environmentalist uh, theory and history and criticism to the oceans. So you've brought this this uh, large I did. book here. I did. Tell us what this book is and, and what did. you wanted to show us. So this is Claire Nubian's book, The Deep. It's called The Extraordinary Creatures of the Abyss. There's the, the front image, which is quite spectacular. Um, I'll show you one more. There we go. Uh, so when I started this project, um, I found this little New Yorker cartoon, and it has uh, various middle-aged white women sitting around a coffee table um, having tea, and the caption is, one woman says, I don't know why I don't care about the creatures at the bottom of the sea, but I don't. And, <laughs> and I thought, you know, in the sense of how much, th this sort of exhausted empathy, right? Like how mm -hmm. far should our empathy extend? How far can environmental concern extend? Mm -hmm. I think that question is very striking. And then since it's, they're sitting around a coffee table, I imagine a book like this with these beautiful aesthetic images ending up on the coffee table. And my question is, what can they do? Mm -hmm. So what can these images of all of these creatures do? And then how do they circulate between science and art? How does aesthetics mix into science and art and popular culture and environmental concern? So, so that's you've, what I'm you've tracking. Just, you've just raised a lot of very interesting questions. <laughs> and I don't know how far along you are in this project. But can you give us a sense of the kinds of answers you're coming up with to those questions or any of those questions? Mm. I mean, I, wh why don't we just, for the sake of the, the kind of p the ability of art mm -hmm. to help in this project, mm -hmm. you want to say a little bit about that? Well, I think, I think if, I, if I bookmark the project, I'm starting with William Beebe in the 1930s mm -hmm. where he goes down in his bathosphere with Otis Barton a half mile down. And he was a, an explorer and scientist and he's describing the creatures he sees. He didn't have the right photography, um, the, the right cameras to be able to, to photograph them at that point. But he was someone who didn't want to separate science and art and literature and he he was a fan of Darwin and he was a fan of um, uh, Alice in Wonderland and he didn't want that to all be separated mm -hmm. it was bef it was right at the time where science was becoming super objective mm -hmm. and those divisions between mm -hmm. natural history and cultures. natural history right yeah the two cultures so he was opposed to that and it's interesting because he was criticized for his descriptions of these creatures he's they, the creatures that actually are in this book, some of which ended up um, being photographed later on, um, because that they weren't properly scientific. He didn't have the specimens. He wasn't do so that sense of what is real science? Mm -hmm. How is it defined? How is the aesthetic 
in or out of real science. Because then when you go to the early, the late 20th century, early 21st century, you have the census of marine life, which um, uses these extremely aestheticized images of creatures. Mm -hmm. And they are very interested in including the humanities and in including the arts in the marine census, which is this huge global um, scientific project. Hmm. And so it's interesting that the aesthetic comes back around. And it's not, it's not that it's properly scientific, but one of the things that interests me about the deep sea creatures is that so little is known about them mm -hmm. that a lot of the times the scientists um, react the same way you or I would react. like. Wow, that's so weird, that's so cool, what is that thing? Mm -hmm. And that's the reaction which is, has this sort of affective and aesthetic dimension mm -hmm. and isn't, again, not properly, say, scientific. And so I'm, I'm interested in those borders mm -hmm. and how the creatures kind of go through those borders and what that all means. So you can give us a sense of the kind of uh, research that you're doing for this project? What, what are you looking at? What are the materials that you're examining? Um, well, some coffee table books, uh, <laughs> but I also went to the, uh, I went to two different um, archives. Uh, one was at the Bronx Zoo, mm. and that's where Else Bostelman's paintings were, and oh. Bostelman's just fantastic. So she was the one who did the paintings for William Beebe of these sea creatures, and so I spent a week there um, looking at all of her paintings, and so little is known about her. Um, which is it could because there was a house fire and things burned but but she's starting to get a little bit more recognition but her the way that she depicted the creatures as surreal actually is probably um probably had a huge effect on how they're they've been represented ever since mm. um so she did she did many many paintings for national geographic of of the creatures i also went to bb's archive in princeton and spent a long time there unfortunately his handwriting was so bad that some of the materials i could not make sense of uh. but other things were really interesting that i saw there and so, and then of course all the marine, the Census of Marine Life websites with their videos, they have these amazing videos about the creatures and they do all of these things to make them really exciting to a lay audience. Mm -hmm. um, where, what I haven't quite fit in yet is science fiction because I'm uh -huh. thinking about including some science fiction in there as well. Uh, but because it's not visual, it becomes something really different. But I th I'm still hoping to do that. Mm. Very interesting, very yeah. interesting. So, um, you are, in addition to being a scholar, you are also a teacher. So um, can you tell us about one course that you're gonna be teaching at the University of Oregon? Um, I will be teaching a graduate and an undergraduate course on environmental theory this spring, so. Yes. Can you say something about that? <laughs> I mean, how you approach that problem? Well, I, I am new to the quarter system. So uh -huh. I've taught many years the semester system. Mm -hmm. I'm used to longer courses. Mm -hmm. So this has been very difficult for me to figure out what I want to do in this course and whether I want to give a kind of snapshot of different theoretical approaches to environmentalism or key in on something specific. But I've taught undergraduate theory courses before and lots of graduate courses in theory, environmental theory, and the students really love the, the, the theory class. So part of it, I think they'll, they'll be applying some of the theories to things in everyday life. Maybe we'll have a, a blog site where they do a f photographs and then apply the theory to what they photographed, something like that. And, so. and have you ever taught any of the Blue Humanities material? I have. I've done a couple courses on the ocean. And, and mm -hmm. how has that gone? Fabulous. Yeah, fabulous. My sense is that the that young people are really interested in the ocean and what's going on in the ocean. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's a. It's yeah. It's it's a very exciting thing to teach because there is a lot of interest in it, and you can because there hasn't been as much written too. It's you can easily jump from say the Odyssey to mm. um, more recent work, and you know. I have one other question about the Blue Humanities Project. You didn't mention when I asked you what kind of materials are mm. there, um, you said maybe some science fiction. Are there any other kinds of traditional literary materials that you're looking at or is it primarily um, gonna be non-literary stuff? Well, actually, there's a lot of science writing. So mm -hmm. again, mm -hmm. this is sort of where, I, I think that the sciences are so important in the humanities. So there's a yep. lot of popular science writing that I'm interested in. There's also scientific memoirs 
I'm very interested in those, how people are writing about um, their own processes in science. And then the, the last thing I would like to do, although I haven't set it up yet, is I would like to do what I think uh, it was Bruno Latour and maybe Wolgar said, follow scientists around. So mm -hmm. I'd like to go to Mbari, um, uh, where they're actually, they have these uh, deep sea rovers and they're, they're looking at these creatures. And I wanna just watch the scientists reaction and see how they're working and what they're doing. So mm -hmm. I would like to do a little of that science studies work if I could, mm -hmm. um, but I haven't started the process of, of figuring out how to do that. Mm -hmm. So so yeah, so a, a mix of literature, art, um, maybe some of this sort of observation. But. So uh, you were in Texas for 25 years? Yes. You had a very successful career there. What attracted you to the University of Oregon? University of Oregon is has been one of the very, very strongest places for environmental studies for a very long time. So um, definitely the commitment to environmental studies, um, the excellent English department, of course. Um, there's just, there's amazing faculty here and programs, and so I'm excited to be here. And it's in Oregon. Who doesn't want to be in Oregon? <laughs> <Shh>. <laughs> yeah, don't tell everyone, <laughs> but it's beautiful here. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, uh, we have a couple of minutes left. This will probably be my last question. Um, you used the term Anthropocene before, mm -hmm. and uh, this is a term that's widely used in environmental studies now. Right. Um, but there are, you, one of the things you've you've written about are some of the problems with how the Anthropocene is usually conceptualized. So mm -hmm, tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about that. So if you go online and you look up the Anthropocene, you will find so many visual images, um, either whether they're paintings or whether they are photographs where it's someone way up here looking at the world way down there. And so the, pers the dominant perspective on the Anthropocene puts us, again, the opposite of transcorporeality, mm -hmm. it puts us way above on some magical space that's not on the planet that we've messed up, and we're just looking at it, ah, there it is. And then the predominant theories about the Anthropocene, such as uh, Dipesh Chakrabarti's, stress the human actions upon the planet and human agency in this huge way where we've become this in, um, equivalent to a geological force. But again, the way of framing it is that we're not part of that. And mm -hmm. so for me, with the, the theory of transcorporeality, I think you have to think of your own body with all of these chemicals already in it that we're already woven into this structure, the Anthropocene, and our perspectives of it should account for that and it needs to be multi-species because almost all of these images, because they're taken from so far away, you can see human structures and human uh, lights, let's say, you know, the planet lit up at night or something, but you can't see any animals and you can't see, say, the migratory routes of whales. So in the mapping, they'll have the migratory maps of, um, or not migratory maps, but the shipping routes or the military routes. All of the animals, all other life is wiped out. It's disappeared and there's this thing that we have somehow created that's down there, and that's that's what got us into the problem in the first place. And so. on that uh, very good note, well, thank you, Stacy, <laughs> okay. for taking the time to talk with us today. It's thank been really you. interesting. Welcome to the University of Oregon. Thank you so much, thank you. I've been speaking with Stacy Alimo, a professor of English and environmental studies at the University of Oregon. Her most recent book is Exposed, Environmental Politics and Pleasures in Post-Human Times. Thanks so much for watching.